associated with that and limit a lot of the, uh, the access. Level. So those two kind of fell out, but those other options uh, kind of did move forward. And with those uh, other options, we get into more detailed analysis where we do look at the capital costs associated with building those, the operating costs, the maintenance costs. We also have this thing called a baseline alternative. And the baseline alternative is really kind of something that doesn't exist, but the federal government wants to know what is the best that you can possibly do without actually making the substantial investments. You kind of have to create uh, additional enhancements kind of uh, on paper to study those and say, this major build option versus some of these other options, and how do they compare? One of the major focuses also is the feeder bus network, and how do those other bus lines tie into this main truck trunk line? So here's just kind of a map. Each one of these build options also has the feeder bus network that is associated with it, and we've got some of the details of you know, how potentially would the service be rerouted to kind of feed into some of these stations and bring more ridership into the trunk line. Next slide. And one of the things that, for this area, I'm not sure if everyone's aware of, but as part of the uh, Access Minneapolis, this was a plan done by the city of Minneapolis. They looked at uh, a 10 year transportation plan, and one of the considerations that they looked at was a potential streetcar line for the city of Minneapolis uh, and a variety of streetcar lines. One of the specific options was to come up along Washington and go along West Broadway and come to the uh, Robbinsdale uh, transit line. So that was one of the things that you know, we want to be cognizant of, that uh, the city is looking at that option as well. Can you just explain very briefly the difference between streetcar and light rail? Thank you, Council Member Sandy. It's uh, a streetcar. A streetcar is really uh, kind of a step down from light rail. It's really not about providing these longer station spaces. It's really about much closer. It's more analogous to a bus. It is fixed rail. Uh, it doesn't operate in its own separate guideway, whereas you know, light rail and BRT that we're looking at, they really kind of operate in their own specific areas. They don't get caught up in congestion and other areas like that, whereas uh, uh, streetcar really just goes within the street. It goes with the car, so unfortunately it does kind of get caught up in some of the uh, congestion as well. But it's really about having more stops and more access. Uh, the city of uh, Portland has done a great deal of kind of redevelopment in their city along some of these uh, streetcar lines. So that's just something that we'll so, keep it in mind as well. So, yes? Streetcar has a, a decreased passenger capacity. It's more probably analogous with what you see on a, on a city bus than a light rail vehicle. They usually just operate as, as one vehicle, whereas a, a light rail system, you may see two or three cars that can all be linked together. So there's a greater uh, people moving capacity, I guess, than, than a light rail. It's just a different mode. It has, it serves different markets than, uh, than a light rail system. This gets into the, the series then of, of the lines that we really looked at. We've got the kind of A segment out of Maple Grove, a B segment up in Brooklyn Park, a C segment that's really kind of common in the middle. Then we get down to the D segment, and we had a variety of them that we're looking at here in kind of through North Minneapolis area. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, can you go back to the previous one? I just want to talk briefly about you know, these options over here. We have uh, different D options that we talked about. This is option D1, which really kind of stays within the railroad corridor comes down to Highway 55 and then east of Highway 55 into downtown. Uh, D2 option that we're going to talk about momentarily as well. That comes out of the railroad corridor in Robbinsdale, come down past North Memorial, down on West Broadway, down on Penn, and then east on 55. We also looked at uh, uh, Lowry, going across on Lowry, then down on Lindale. We did look at that option, as well as the bus rapid transit option only for uh, West Broadway. Next slide, please. So this talks about, uh, what I mentioned earlier, about $9 DI that we looked at and 12 BRT options. Uh, as far as looking at those options, we have 21 options. So we have 21 options, you know, our next big challenge is, how do you go from 21 down to something else? Well, we had those goals and objectives that I talked about earlier. Uh, we had 31 evaluation criteria that we really looked at to try and figure out what are the best options, uh, what are the impacts, what are the benefits, looking at all of that evaluation criteria. Then we kind of get down to uh, even a smaller subset of options that, that really kind of move forward. Uh, this fall, we did have uh, five open house meetings. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Twins ended up in the playoffs, uh, so we were competing against the Twins on some of the nights, but even surprisingly, we had a good turnout for some of these meetings on the same nights that, that the Twins were playing, so it was great to see the excitement that people were coming out to a lot of these meetings. We've had a lot of other stakeholder meetings, a total of about 470 people that we met in the production of those meetings. How did the change in the policy, like,
we're looking at trying to get into the most promising results. What is the greatest likelihood of actually getting constructed? Next slide. Uh, when we talk about the evaluation goals, we really wanted to look at enhancing the regional mobility of people. We really want to look at expanding the effectiveness of transit within the corridor. That means not just access to downtown, but getting out to the suburbs as well and the areas in between. We really want to try and provide a cost-effective and a financially feasible system. We want to try and get something that can actually get built and get implemented. That's really the goal. Uh, we also want to look at encouraging transit support and land use and development patterns. This isn't just about transportation, but a lot of it's about land use, changing the land use, increasing the densities along a lot of these transit lines. We also want to support sustainable communities and sound environmental practices. This really gets into the potential impacts. We want to be aware of the neighborhoods that we're going through. These lines do have impacts on people. We want to be cognizant of those impacts as part of the evaluation. So with those five goals that I just talked about, we had a series of evaluation measures that totaled 31 measures. And uh, those measures, if you look at that goal one and goal two, those really talk about potential benefits of the line. Uh, number goal number uh, four here really talks about uh, the potential land use. Those are really some of the opportunities that might happen as a result of some of the lines. And then goal five were the impacts. We wanted to, to be cognizant of those impacts and how do those impacts relate. We also have, again, the cost and effectiveness issues that we talked about again. So we roll that over, we combine all that and kind of get to a technical score and then the project costs, looking at all those 21 options based upon this criteria. The next slide. So if you look at uh, all of those options that we looked at before, uh, there was a desire on the northern end to not rule out A or B. Uh, there seems to be a little bit more support for going toward uh, the B option than the A option initially, but people said, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't really uh, lose focus on the possibility of maybe keeping both ends open on the north. We look at the options kind of through uh, North Minneapolis. We have both the D1 and the D2 option, and those were really the two that really kind of rose to the top. Those had uh, you know, the greatest amount of benefits and kind of the least amount of uh, of impacts. Although there, there are different impacts associated with the D1, the D2, and some of the challenges get into uh, providing access, which is a good thing. But unfortunately, to provide access to some people, there's also some of the impacts that are associated with that as well. <coughs> One next slide. Uh, the specific D1 options that getting zooming in here a little bit further on those options. Uh, the D1 option, it does have the station Robbinsdale that I mentioned. That's right in downtown Robbinsdale. That comes along with the BSF corridor. We have one station at uh, Golden Valley Road. Then turn uh, east on Highway 55, have a station at Penn, another one at Van White, and then we have uh, the downtown station at the uh, Minneapolis Interchange. That's right next to the Detroit Ballpark. The D2 option, uh, to get into the specifics of that, we would have a station again at Robbinsdale. The first one is at North Memorial, and we'd have, uh, no, excuse me, uh, yeah, the first one there's at North Memorial, then we'd have one at uh, West Broadway and Penn, then come south, just right over here, we'd have one at Penn and Plymouth, then turn east, and have another one at uh, Van White, and then the other one at the end. So those are really the options that we're really looking at, as far as these are some of the best options moving forward. Now we're also looking at some of the optimization of this, and when we look at those 21 options, we kind of narrow it down, and then we figure the, the modelers go in and kind of do some of the tweaking figure, and we make some of those options a little bit better. So we did look at some of those uh, greater ones and go to the next slide, Brent. Uh, looking at some of those specifics that we talked about and some of those options that really kind of rose to the top. Uh, we'll talk about, first of all, the Maple Grove via the D1 option. That's really at 12.7 miles. It takes approximately 27, 26 minutes to get from end to end. We would have 11 stations. Uh, the parking ride uh, path we would need is about uh, 25 miles tall. Uh, next would be the Brooklyn Park via the D1. Uh, that's a little bit longer, it takes slightly longer. And uh, the last one is kind of the Maple Grove uh, pen option. Uh, that's, again, pretty close to the uh, uh, the other one that we looked at, pretty much the same length. It does take a little bit longer now. When it is operating <coughs> on the city streets, uh, the light rail pretty much runs the same speed as the local traffic. That's one big concern that people don't want to have. The trains coming through 55 miles per hour through uh, neighborhood streets. So they do try and go at the same speed as the, uh, the local traffic. So it does take a little bit longer uh, coming in on the city streets versus the, uh, the rail port. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at some of those other evaluation measures, uh, here we look at the ridership. How do the three of those uh, compare on ridership? Well, you can see that they're, they're, they're pretty good from a regional perspective. Uh, uh, we knew we were going to have some challenges with this quarter, trying to get the numbers high enough just based upon some of the results we have uh, seen from an earlier study that the Metropolitan Council had done looking at uh, a variety of transit across the region. Uh, that study showed us that uh, you know, after the Central Corridor, it'll probably qualify for like, uh, the Southwest Corridor at the bottom of they could put